Let's see, where do I want? Let's go to Acts chapter 1. Let's go ahead and open our Bibles up there. It's good to have everybody here tonight, everybody watching online. Got some, uh, some prayer requests. Got one of our online families going through uh, a tough time. And uh, it's something that goes all the way back years ago. And uh, I've, I've had this theory for quite a while now. I think it's biblical. You can see it when Pharaoh tried to kill all the, the, um, the newborn children out of the camp of Israel and uh, actually succeeded in killing a bunch of them. Uh, but the one, the very one that they needed to get, they didn't get, and that was Moses. And then the same thing when Christ was born. Herod figured out that Jesus Christ must be about two years old or younger, and so he ordered the soldiers to go out and kill every male child two years old and younger in an effort to kill Jesus. But the angel of the Lord came to Joseph, told Joseph, get thee up down to Egypt. That fulfilled prophecy. By the way, Herod fulfilled Bible prophecy, didn't he? A chain of events because the Old Testament said God called his son out of Egypt. Sure did. He did it in the Old Testament, Jacob his son, Israel his son, God called him out of Egypt, Abraham, and then, then Jesus. But uh, Joseph was able to get Jesus and Mary uh, out of danger, and the very one that Herod sought to kill, he missed. And so I, I believe that the devil can kind of get an idea it's sort of like an animal instinct, if you want to call it that. And, um, you know, they say sharks, certain sharks can smell blood in the water a mile away. Uh, I've tried doing that. All I got was salt up my nose. I didn't smell any blood. Uh, but they say they can, they can detect that. Other animals that are keen to... Um, going after rotted flesh can detect that smell way farther than us humans can. They just get an idea of maybe an animal that's weak or an animal that uh, has some kind of condition where it's not, not really going to make it in the, in the wild very long and, and certain predators can key in on that. And I think the devil um, gets an idea in his mind of of people that are going to end up being a threat to his work and his kingdom, and he messes with them. He tries to interrupt their childhood, tries to clap them in bondage at the earliest age possible. That way, he figures they'll never, ever, ever want to serve Christ because they're in bondage. But God is really good about getting slaves out and making them free. Amen? He's really good at that, and that's what he's done with us. And that's what he's done with millions of others. And uh, that's why I love my Savior the way I do. All right, Acts chapter 1. Um, let's pick it up in verse 4. The key passage is um, what Jesus says here. Verse 4, being assembled together with them, that commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but, and here we have red letter words, which the, uh, I found out the Amish and Mennonite tell their people that those words uh, are mistakes. They shouldn't be in the Bible. That's crazy. But anyway, that what, wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And then, of course, they go into asking him about uh, will he restore the kingdom and, and whatnot. And Jesus has an answer for that. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, how's Brother Roy doing? Is he doing better? Hey, I, I got to tell this. God hears prayers. Of course he does. 
we've been praying for Roy all this time. He gets in the hospital, supposed to have a, a, a colonoscopy on Monday, and they run some tests on him over the weekend. Doctors determined that there is no cancer. There's no cancerous cells. There's no cancer anywhere. They canceled the colonoscopy. Amen! Amen! And so now Roy's got to live. He ain't real happy about that. He wanted to go see Bonnie. He did. Bless his heart. You pray for him. Okay? You pray for him. Talk about being torn and split like Paul was. For me to live as Christ, to die is gain. Okay? It's more expedient that Paul stays here, but he sure is looking forward to that dinner table in heaven. Amen? And uh, so that's probably been on his mind, but God, God answers prayer. That's not the first time I've seen that happen. And um, you just kind of hang around long enough, you're going to see God do some good things. Amen. If God will do it for somebody like Roy, who are, who are we? Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for answering our prayers. And Lord, uh, we thank you, Lord, for uh, what you've done with Brother Roy. We love that man, and we thank you for him, Lord. He's such a blessing to all of us here. And he just makes it interesting around here. And we ask God that you be with him tonight. Continue to bless him and help him. Uh, Father, bless those, Lord, that have reached out to us. And, Lord, they have uh, some very serious things going on. I pray, dear God, that you would help them. Give them uh, encouragement. Give them blessing. And, Father, Lord, all the people, all the people in this world that are, are listening to us tonight and... The devil and the world has sent them a rejection notice, told them that they're not good enough, that they're not, they don't fit in. Uh, Lord tells them that they just need to go on out of the way and so on. Father, you're the one that has taken all the rejects of life and all those, Lord, who have been put out and those that nobody wants anything to do with anymore. Lord, you've gathered us together into this one place. And Father, we thank you for that. Not just the folks here, but all the people online. And Lord, I love you for that. And I pray, dear God, that you would bless all of us misfits. And Lord, help us to always be encouraged at the good news that we hear of what you've done with somebody's life. Because, Father, if you can do it for them, we know you can do it for us. And Father, we just call upon you and ask you, God, Lord, that you help us in each and every day that we try to live for you. Some days it's harder than others. And my heart goes out to anybody tonight that's hearing me that is struggling, uh, not doing well. The world has called them a misfit. The world has rejected them. They don't want them there. They don't want them anywhere around them. Churches have run some of these people off and told them that they probably shouldn't go to that church anymore. And, and Lord, Father, you've gathered them with us and we'll take them. We ask God, Lord, that you bless each and every one, both young and old. Bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen. I want to go back and, and look at the, the doctrine of this in 1 Peter. This is kind of, we touched on this last Wednesday night, but just very quickly, because I think this is really relevant for what we're going to look into. The subject is, did Jesus uh, deliberately leave off, and I'm not saying the Bible's a mistake, I'm not saying there's any mistakes in the Bible. But did Jesus deliberately leave off the idea of what John said when Jesus was baptized? John said, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And Jesus comes along and says, wait for the promise of the Father. You should be baptized in the Holy Ghost. But he didn't finish it. Now, some might say uh, you're kind of uh, pointing to a negative or you're pointing to a hole in scriptures and trying to fill it up with something. Well, maybe so. I don't know. But I just, when I see things like this in 1 Peter, and then when I see it in other places, and I understand a little bit about maybe how God uh, might work this thing. By the way, I've been, I've been up to my eyeballs today in um, UFO stories. I, I recorded a two-hour-long video. That's, oh, that's hard to do. And um, I was up late last night getting the notes all together and everything like that. And I can tell you there is an evil agenda that goes with this. Do I believe that they're like the Klingons or the Vulcans or the Tatooine or whatever? Do I believe that? No. I believe, I believe the devil has got a very, very big um, 
deception planned for something that's going to happen one day. I don't know when it's going to happen, but I guarantee you it will involve E.T. It will involve that idea, that concept. And this fire baptism is linked in with that. So let's see it. Peter said in verse 6, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Manifold means many, many times over, folded over. They just keep rolling in. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory and at what time? At the appearing of Jesus Christ. And that is, I'm sorry to some people, but that's the translation. That's the rapture. That's when we're caught up at the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, also in 1 Peter chapter 4, Beloved, think it not a strange, think it not strange, concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you like you didn't get raptured when you thought you were going to. You were waiting for a trumpet to sound and dead people to come up out of the, out of the ground and you didn't, that didn't happen. And so you think it's some strange thing. Well, that's, this probably has nothing to do with Bible prophecy. Listen. If what I think is going to happen happens, I guarantee you it's going to have something to do with Bible prophecy. I mean, it's like everywhere. As though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice. This is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to rejoice. Inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Joy that exceeds joy. The joy of this world will not compare to the joy, the exceeding joy that you and I will receive. And it's not a joy that we try to manifest or try to pump into you by way of the music that we played tonight. Yeah, I, I like to sing happy songs. I like to sing songs in the Lord and, and be happy about it. But I can't manifest that kind of joy in you. If I did, it would only be temporary. Christ can manifest exceeding joy in us so that while we are in the fire, while we're Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, looking at that furnace, heated up seven times hotter than it's ever been, and you know they're going to throw you in there. You've already told Nebuchadnezzar, hey, we believe our God's going to save us. Even if he don't, we're not bowing to that. We got commandments. We, we have rules we live by. Can I say something about this very wicked generation in this country? They don't know what law is. They don't know what rules are. This is a generation that has never been told no by their parents or their broken home roommates. They've never been turned down. They've never been told no. They stomp their feet and insist that we use bizarre pronouns to describe them. And think nothing of it. Just at that, that because we didn't bow to them and use the proper pronouns with them, that we ought to be, we ought to be killed. We ought to be uh, cleaned and scoured off the earth. I say, go ahead. Amen? Go ahead. We're just the salt and light of this world. Amen? And when we leave, I guarantee you, it's going to get a lot worse after God takes us off. And so, you don't want us around? That's fine. Sure, sure they are. It, it is becoming a very lawless... I mean, they had to shut down how many universities already? To, and they're caving in to the, uh, uh, those who are, I want to say crusading, but it's not a crusade. Those who are uh, marching against Israel. And I'll tell you, 
Uh, J.R. knows, it, he's kind of like me, we kind of like to look at World War II, and I like to examine it from Hitler's point of view and understand exactly how it was that he got the German people to turn so much against the Jews so that when the brown shirts went through on Kristallnacht, that was a, a night in Germany where the, Hitler's brown shirt thugs went through with bats and iron tools and just busted out all the windows of every Jewish-owned shop in every town, in every burg in Germany. The government seized all of their bank accounts, shut down their businesses, basically forced them into poverty. They tried to ship them out of the country. Nobody wanted them. Nobody would let them move in. And so uh, it was Eichmann uh, who came up with the final solution. And they said, we can use the rail cars. And the rabbis themselves helped load the Jews onto the cars. I don't understand that. But anyway, they shipped them off to the gas chambers and gassed uh, somewhere in the neighborhood. They used to take them out into the forest. Um, I can't remember the name. Einsatzgruppen or something like that was the name of the German soldiers that were tasked with having the Jews walk down into a ditch that had been dug out for this purpose, stand there while they're all shot to death. Men, women, babies. All of them massacred. They fall down in the pit and then they cover up the, the, the bodies with that dirt. Millions of people done away just like that. And I'm telling you, I never thought, I never thought I'd see the day in this country where I thought maybe government policy, you know, might be against Israel in some future war. And that would be, that would be triggering God's wrath. I never, I never thought the people of this country would turn out in such massive numbers with one stated purpose in their mouth, kill Israel. I never thought I'd see that. In the streets of America, I never thought I'd see that. But that's what we're seeing. And I'm tell you what, people, don't curse Israel. Don't do it. You bless them. God's going to save them one of these days. And I want to be on God's side. Amen. Amen. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. His glory is going to be revealed one of these days. And let us be glad with exceeding joy. Now, uh, I pointed out things like this last Wednesday. Conferences. Fire from heaven conference. Okay. And they've got it sort of like. Like that, this guy here is Elijah. Let's say he's, he's supposed to be Elijah, and he's calling the fire of God down. So, so let's say that that might be true. What if you're the bull on the altar? Doesn't work out so good for you, does it? Okay? Join us for a night of fire with our youth band. Oh, I bet I know what that's going to sound like. Okay? It is going to be absolute chaos. Pretending to be God's fire coming down from heaven, but it's not. Uh, within you is a fire from heaven. This is from uh, the Lubavitchers. Shabbat Lubavitch is the name of the organization. Shabbat.org is their website. And they promote this thing. Within you is a fire from heaven. Never underestimate the power of your soul. They're the ones telling everybody that they have a spark of divinity in them. And you can hear it in movies. You can hear it in TV shows, commercials. You name it. All the, Walmart's logo. Do you know what Walmart's Sun Ray logo is called? Spark. That's the official corporate name of their little... It's got three rays pointing up and three rays pointing down. And the official name, copyrighted name, trademark name of that symbol is called Spark. And what it's about is this idea that we all have a spark of divinity in us and we need something will happen that will cause that spark to erupt into a full flame where you and I will become gods. What was the promise that Satan made? You shall be as gods. I've talked about that for two hours today. 
that everything in the UFO movement, if you just want to get an idea of where it's headed, it's trying to convince people that they don't have to fear death anymore. Because some of these people have found out from the UFO knots that death is a, a, a mirage. It's not real. That rather than dying and being judged for eternity, you'll just be recycled into a higher form. That is exactly what the devil did with Eve in the Garden of Eden. And Paul said, follow what he did in, in 2 Corinthians 11. He said, just the way he tricked Eve is the way he's going to trick everybody else in the last days. He's going to convince them that they will not die. And that's what he said, you should not surely die. Then tell them that God has a secret doctrine that he can't tell everybody. Satan's going to be the hero now and express it to everybody. And then that everybody can have their eyes open and become God's knowing good and evil. And uh, I mean, I've just been shoulder deep in this stuff today. So forgive me if it starts oozing out of my mouth tonight. God culture and so on and so on. This is Bethel Church's fire tunnel. Those are the people that go to graves and practice necromancy. Grave sucking, they call it. They go to grave sites of people they think are, are saints of God, and they've been told that there is still an anointing left in them, and that if they go to their grave and pray over their grave, they can pull up that anointing and have it in their life. That's, that's necromancy, that's witchcraft, just like God said it was. You're messing with devils is what you're doing by this. And they literally walk people through a, what they call a fire tunnel. They're passing their children through the fire under Molex, what they're doing. And the, God, the first thing out of God's mouth in Deuteronomy 18, uh, you should not make your son or daughter pass through the fire. Now, back to this, 1 Peter 4, 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be also glad with exceeding joy. Then he says this in verse 14. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. So I'm perceiving now that just as the people who are in the streets of America right now, who are in, on the college campuses that they are marching in protest to the people of God, which is Israel. Who else might be the people of God in this country? That would be us. Do you think they would spare us and only go after the Jews? No. No, no, no. There is already an atmosphere in this country of hatred toward People of faith, people who say they believe God, people who say they believe in Jesus Christ, people who say they believe the word of God. There is already rising an atmosphere of hatred. And I don't mean like, ooh, get away from those people. Those are religious people. I mean hatred like we need to eliminate them from America because America can never advance and become fully woke until these stupid Christians are put out of the way. And I think that that spirit is gaining ground in this world right now, okay? When you, listen, you, be, we, we should have been watching it take place in other countries for the last 30 or 40 years. It's coming here, right to the heart of America. And I'm, listen, I think it's a serious, serious time that's coming. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. If Jesus is not ashamed to call you brother, you don't be ashamed of Jesus Christ. Amen? Young people, don't, don't dismay at your mom and dad wanting to pray in public at a restaurant over the food. Don't turn away from that. Don't shy away from it. Don't think that that's embarrassing you. They're doing what God said to do. They're living for God and they're living out their testimony for Jesus Christ. No, they're not perfect, and you probably know things about them, but they're trying to live a testimony for Jesus Christ. And they've decided they're not going to put anything in their mouth until they tell God, thank you for giving it to them to put in their mouth. And so join in with them. If your parents are happy to be Christians, 
You, hap you be happy to be a Christian. Amen. Happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. Always glorify Jesus Christ in everything that you do. Um, all right, now, number one, let's look at this. Jesus said, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Baptism in the word of God, Matthew 3, 11, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. What could that fire be? Isaiah 30, verse 27. Behold, the name of the Lord cometh from far, burning with his anger. And the burden thereof is heavy. His lips are full of indignation and his tongue as a devouring fire. Remember I told you, fire does two things. Number one, it gives light. So in that sense, it's a good thing. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The five wise virgins had their lamps trimmed and they were full of oil. So that when the bridegroom called, all they had to do was light their lamps and go in with the bridegroom. But the foolish virgins didn't bother to open their Bible and read it and believe it. They didn't bother with that. They said, oh, we got time. We'll do it later. Well, the bridegroom came, and now they have no oil. Now they're going to those that were wise and say, give us of your oil. And the wise people say, no, get out of here. Go buy your own like we did. I don't think Jesus was a socialist. Amen? Go buy your own. I think if people have a cell phone, they ought to buy it themselves instead of have the government give it to them. Amen? Amen! Boy, I'm, I'm getting mingled in with stuff. Behold the name of the Lord. His lips are full of indignation. His tongue is a devouring fire. In Jeremiah 5, he says, Wherefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because ye speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire. And this people would, and it shall devour them. Oh, I just got a revelation here. Turn to Revelation. <laughs> Chapter, yeah, turn to chapter 11. Oh, that's all we needed, J.R., more rain, right? That's all we needed. Um, for those of you who don't live around here, we got rain Monday night or Sunday night into Monday morning. Uh, you see the Joachim, the Merrimack, they're all getting close to the top of the banks there. We ain't seen that in a while, so we'll take it. But anyway, uh, Revelation chapter 11. God says in verse 3, I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Now, that time frame is um, uh, three and a half years, 42 months, a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. John the Baptist was, I think, a foreshadow of that. He was clothed in sackcloth. Verse 4, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. If you don't have a reference for that, that is Zechariah uh, chapter 6. Was I right on that? Chapter 6? Zechariah or chapter 4? One of the two. It's in Zechariah. Start at the beginning and stop when you get there. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Verse 5, and if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth. Look at that. Isn't that what God said here in Jeremiah? I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. So that prophecy seems to me to be linked to Revelation 11, 5. If any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. I think God means business now, don't you? And um, so, uh, by the way, I, I do believe, um, and I'm not 100% sure, and I'm not 100% sure on anything, but 
Uh, I do believe that the ministry of these two witnesses, I don't believe that will be here at that time. I could be wrong, but I, I don't think so. So, once we're in heaven, seek me out. And then I'm either going to laugh at you and then give you a big old hug, or you're going to laugh at me and walk away. Uh, look at verse 6. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Hey, didn't Elijah do that? And for how long did it not rain? Yeah, three and a half years, 42 months, but 1,203 score days. See how the typology plays into this? God has a prophecy here, then he draws a picture of it for you, for you to look at and say, oh, I know what that looks like. Read about Elijah and have power over waters to turn them to blood. Is that in the Bible somewhere else? Moshe, Moses, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Moses again. Man. You can read the whole Old Testament right here in Revelation, which is what we're doing on Sunday morning. And they will, uh, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And that kind of reigns on the parade, doesn't it? But are they worried? No. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. We're talking about Jerusalem here. And if you want to understand what this means, go back. You make a little note here and go back and read Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel 16 is where God ties Jerusalem in with Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So we have, so there's no misunderstanding here. It's talking about earthly Jerusalem, where Jesus was crucified. He calls it Sodom and Egypt, so on and so forth. All right, now, uh, Jeremiah 5, 14. Wherefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because you speak this word. Behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. Jeremiah 23, 29. Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? You don't need Thor's hammer. You need God's, amen? You got a rock in your way? You got a rock keeping you from living right, living for God? Take the word of God, make it a hammer, and beat that rock into pieces and say, rock, get out of my way. I'm going to live for God, amen? Nothing, nothing is too hard for God. Nothing is. Everything is too hard for us. But nothing is too hard for God. Um, Acts chapter 7, verse 30. This is, I love this. When Stephen got a chance to preach to the 70 elders who were the judges of Israel, he downright let them have it. They got so mad at Stephen for what he said here they ripped their clothes, they screamed, and they took him out, and they stoned him with stones. They were so mad at him for saying what he said. And if, if you want to try to understand typology really good, study. I don't mean just read it once. I mean study Acts 7, because everything that Stephen says... He's pointing out the prophecies of the typology in the Old Testament, how they always pointed to Christ. And, that's, and, the, and the Jews got it. They understood it. They knew what he was doing. And they're like, I'm going to kill him for that. I want to bash his skull in with a stone. He makes me angry. And I'll tell you what, I've been watching this guy on YouTube. He's a, he is a born-again Jew. And he speaks Hebrew, probably Yiddish. And he films himself in Jerusalem witnessing to Jews that are out on the street. And here's something that I've learned. Your average Jew today, if they, if they are religious Jews in any way, their rabbis tell them what they can and cannot think. 
Just like a Catholic priest or a bishop or the Pope. It's the same, just like in the Amish and Mennonite communities. That bishop and those elders, they determine what size suspenders you men are going to wear. And if you, don't, if you go against that rule, you're going to get put out and you're going to lose your salvation. Because their uniform is their salvation. Their lifestyle is their salvation. Having a telephone five feet away from their kitchen window so they can reach out and grab it in case the phone rings and take a phone call from there. But they cannot have the phone inside the window. God doesn't want that. And they will, they will take away, they will strip you of your salvation in their eyes. But the Jewish rabbis, I hear these, these Jews that when they can't answer this man's question, and he is nice to him. He's a lot nicer than I would be. He is really nice to him because they're his people. And he asked some easy questions. He said, tell me what you think about Jesus, the Messiah, and don't be afraid of hurting my feelings. And when he gives them things that they cannot answer, they'll just say, our rabbis tell us to not worry about that. They have it all under, they understand it, and that's all that matters. So when Jesus, Jesus in Jesus, forgive me, in Matthew 23, when Jesus is declaring against the scribes and the Pharisees and the hypocrites, it's the rabbis, the religious leaders of the Jews. They have, they have blocked off. They're the gatekeepers of what Jews are going to believe, and they will they will block off every attempt at Jesus getting into the heart of any of those Jews. They have a war against Jesus. And yet he died for them. He still died for them. So here it is when he says, When forty years were expired and there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a what? Flame of fire. Now, stop right here for a minute. We've already seen that a fiery trial is coming. And it's coming at the time of the revealing of our Lord's glory to the whole world. When did Jesus show up to save Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Before they went into the fire? After they got out? He's right in there with them. I would love to be a movie maker and make that movie. I have, a, I have an idea. I'm going to share this with everybody. I'm praying about something. When I was a, when I was a young boy here at this church, we, I think we might still have it. We had a, a film projector. I think a 16 millimeter film projector. That's what we had in the 70s. That was our DVDs back then. And you could rent films from various companies that were evangelistic in nature. One of the films that was rented, and I remember we went out and put flyers on people's car windows at Walmart and places like that. And the movie was called The Burning Hell. And I'm telling you, it was, if you, you can find it on YouTube. It was one of the worst films ever made. I'm telling you, it was bad. The acting's bad, the, the special effects are bad, everything's, but it will scare you to death because it makes you think about hell. And uh, I've, I've thought about, I, I couldn't do anything like this, but I've thought about maybe looking into maybe producing a film called The Burning Hell. Re revive that film, use 21st century graphics now that we have everybody has access to and uh, make a film about that and release it people don't hear about hell anymore so nobody's afraid of anything okay anyway the angel of the lord came to them in a flame of fire in a bush and when moses saw it he wondered at the sight and as he drew near to behold it the voice of the lord came unto him and again stephen is prophesying using Old Testament typology. The numbers mean something, the 40 years mean something, but he just breaks it down to different things and different stories that are in the Old Testament. And when you read it with New Testament glasses, you can clearly see the foreshadowing that he's talking about. And I get, I, again, those Jews knew it. So in Acts chapter 2, 
we have the semblance of this, a partial fulfillment. Acts chapter 2, there, uh, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then there's a whole list of all the different languages they spoke. In verse 11, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And so I think the cloven tongues are a, a like as a fire are a foreshadowing. Again, there it's... It's a story that is a partial fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy happening on the, uh, the, uh, the Feast of Pentecost. Uh, but it also itself points you in the direction of an event that has yet to take place in Bible prophecy. It is still in the future. Um, and I think we'll behold that if we're alive and remain at that particular time. Uh, but notice they were filled with the Holy Ghost and notice that the, 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 the miracle that took place, the, visual, the visible miracle that took place was the fact that they were speaking in languages that, no, that you know they didn't know prior to that day. They're speaking to the Cretes and the Arabians and there's like 15 other groups that they were speaking their language to them. Don't let anybody tell you that they spoke in unknown tongues and then the people heard it in their language. No, they spoke it in their tongue. The Bible's clear on that. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And so I believe it has something to do with, there's a prophecy and I can't remember where it is, but God promised to Israel that he would restore unto them a pure language. Now, um, of course, most of the Jews look at that, and then some Gentile uh, people, scholars, look at that and say that God is going to restore Hebrew to the Jews. Um, what if it's not Hebrew? What if it's not? What if it's a completely different language that we have yet to see manifest on this, on this earth? What if it is? A language that is so pure that there's no way you can defile it. Okay, Hebrew has a lot of misgivings. The fact that it, has, it comes complete with no vowels in it. There's just no vowels except for the aleph. And um, other than that, there's just no vowels in it. So you, the Jews had to come up with different markings and dots and so on to express what vowel they thought should be in there. But they could be wrong. They could be speaking words that don't even sound like the Hebrew that was around in the Old Testament. We don't, I don't know that, but anyway. So I, I tend to think that God's going to restore unto them a pure language, meaning a language that is not defiled, never been defiled, and cannot be defiled. Oh, I shouldn't have seen that lightning out there. That messes with me. I like this one. Psalm 29, 7, The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. And the phrase, voice of the Lord, is found 50 times. Pentecost was on the 50th day. Little things like that. Exodus 19, turn there. This is God and fire together. Exodus 19, Exodus 20. We got some people here tonight that's been practicing memorizing the Ten Commandments. That's a good thing, isn't it? Keep going, keep working that. Exodus 19, 16, it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and light. Now, put your, put your prophecy glasses on. There, there is, this is a foreshadow of an event. There were thunders and lightnings, like there is now, and a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. Moses is now playing the part of Jesus Christ. Remember, we're studying in Sunday school that 
mighty angel that comes down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, face as the sun, he's got a rainbow over his head, his feet are as pillars of fire. And Jesus then is going to lead his people to meet God. Here it's Moses bringing the people out of the camp to meet God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount, and Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in what? Fire. There's your clue. It's basically saying the same thing as what we've already seen, like with Jesus, the Son of God, in the fiery furnace and that, that other place. We're seeing the same thing. The Lord is coming with fire. This is their, I believe, their fire baptism. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. Oh, my goodness. Turn to Revelation again. You should have just stuck your bookmark there. Revelation chapter 9. Look at this. It's another prophecy. Revelation 9, verse 1, The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose what? Smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. That's what happened at Mount Sinai, the smoke of a furnace. I think the Message Bible says vape. Let me take a drink while you think about that for a while. Amen. The Lord descended upon it in fire. There's your, I think there's your fire baptism. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. So in Exodus 20, God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So I have written here, there's a fire that illuminates. There is a fire that consumes. Notice that, if you think about it, when the Lord appeared to Moses the first time, he appeared in fire at the burning bush. But what was it about the bush that got Moses' attention? It wasn't consumed, was it? Okay, so to us, God is not necessarily a consuming fire. God is not consuming us in his wrath with fire. What God is doing with us, hopefully, is that he is illuminating us with the lamp to our feet and the light to our path. He's illuminating us and showing us what's right, what's wrong, how to live right, how to shun what's wrong, and so on and so on. And how to, how to believe his word, how to read his word, how to study his word, how to make the word a, a part of your life and prayer and all of these silly things that we do as Christians. If you read the word of God, God will illuminate you and guide you into these things. If there are questions in your mind about what, what is right or what is wrong, ask God. Uh, I spent two hours upstairs today telling people that God gave us a list in Deuteronomy 18 of all the evil things that they shouldn't do, like divination and witchcraft and sorcery and, and things like that. Why doesn't God want... Yeah. Why doesn't... Why doesn't God want me to have a good time tonight? Why... Why doesn't... I forgot what I was saying now. I don't remember anyway. Thanks for that, Lord. Let's do one more verse. Luke 12. Yeah, I get a little worked up still. Luke chapter 12. Verse 49. Boy, that's a lot of verses in that chapter. <laughs> Y'all remember uh, Randy Casey, right? Well, he was one of my teachers when I went to Twin City Christian Academy. And uh, I really looked up to him, but he was hard on me. And I deserved it. I deserved it. I was bad in seventh grade. I was bad. And um, yeah, 
But anyway, Randy would have very creative ways of punishing me. And uh, sometimes he would have me, he says, you got a choice. You can take three licks with the paddle or you can write a chapter out of the Bible ten times. And I would say, I'll write the chapter. Well, he would pick out something like Luke chapter 12. It's got 59 verses in it. Okay? Or one time, he asked me to write like a 200-word essay on gestalt psychology. We didn't have no internet. There was no internet. But you know what I had? Dad brought home a set of world book encyclopedias. And guess what? It was right there. So I copied half of it and fudged the rest. But I gave him what he wanted. Luke 12, 49. I'm come to send fire on the earth. Look at that. Does that fit with what we're looking into? I think it does. And what will I if it already be? And who has one of those? A Kindle. Yeah, a Kindle. The, the, the language that's being attached to a lot of the products that are out, especially technology, they seem to be somewhat revealing. As I mentioned, Walmart's logo is called The Spark. Amazon's reading platform is called the Kindle. And, and what is kindling for? It kindles a fire. It erupts into a flame of fire. And you, you see these things. He said in verse 50, but I have a baptism. Pay attention to this. I have a baptism to be baptized with. And how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth? I tell you, nay. But rather... Division. Don't listen to these preachers that are saying, let's just break down the walls that separate us. Let's all join together. I dealt with that today, too. Two hours worth of, no, let's not join with everybody else. Elijah was one man alone serving God, and that one man prayed a prayer, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. That one man prayed one time that God would send fire down from heaven, and he did it. And so Jesus has come to set division on this earth, dividing us away from the rest of the people in this world. He says it in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Wherefore come up from among them, and be you separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. For henceforth, he says in verse 52, for from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. Now I'm not exactly sure what that means or why it's there, but I think one day we're going to see it. One day we're going to see it. It's like, well I need to go home and edit this video. I've been talking it out all day. I watched a documentary Last night, while I'm putting my notes together, and this man, Stephen Greer, who leads people into practicing enchantments and going into an altered state of consciousness so they can, so they can contact a UFO. And I'm telling you, spirits show up for this stuff. And I just about fell out of my chair last night because he's, they filmed him leading this group, a big circle of people, about 20 people. And he's leading them into emptying their mind and meditating. And then he says, visualize a triangle. And he said, now visualize a triangle pointing down. Now visualize those triangles coming together. And then visualize the triangles becoming three-sided pyramids. And he said, now focus on the middle. He said, you're all doing this in your mind. He said, now focus on the middle of those two triangles. Because in that place there is a place of peace and safety. I went. So it's in my notes. I couldn't believe he said it. Uh, but I've, I've theorized for a while now that it's not going to be any, any of us or any people on this earth that are going to declare peace and safety. I think it's going to be them. 
We'll see.